Chapter 5, The Seven Lies of Success The world we live in is the world we choose to live in, whether consciously or unconsciously. If we choose bliss, that's what we get. If we choose misery, we get that too. As we learned in the last chapter, belief is the foundation of excellence. Our beliefs are specific, consistent organizational approaches to perception. They're the fundamental choices we make about how to perceive our lives and thus how to live them. They're how we turn on or turn off our brain. So the first step toward excellence is to find the beliefs that guide us toward the outcomes we want. The path to success consists of knowing your outcome, taking action, knowing what results you're getting, and having the flexibility to change until you're successful. The same is true of beliefs. You have to find the beliefs that support your outcome, the beliefs that get you where you want to go. If your beliefs don't do that, you have to throw them out and try something new. People are sometimes put off when I talk about the lies of success. Who wants to live by lies? But all I mean is that we don't know how the world really is. We don't know if our beliefs are true or false. What we can know though, is if they work, if they support us, if they make our lives richer, if they make us better people, if they help us and help others. The word lies is used in this chapter as a consistent reminder that we do not know for certain exactly how things are. The word lie does not mean to be deceitful or dishonest but, rather, is a useful way to remind us that no matter how much we believe in a concept, we should be open to other possibilities and continuous learning. I suggest you look at these seven beliefs and decide whether they're useful for you. I've found them time and again in successful people I have modeled. To model excellence, we have to start with the belief systems of excellence. I've found that these seven beliefs have empowered people to use more, do more, take greater action, and produce greater results. I'm not saying they're the only useful beliefs of success. They are a start. They've worked for others, and I'd like you to see if they can work for you. Belief number one, everything happens for a reason and a purpose, and it serves us. All successful people have the uncanny ability to focus on what is possible in a situation, what positive results could come from it. No matter how much negative feedback they get from their environment, they think in terms of possibilities. They think that everything happens for a reason, and it serves them. They believe that every adversity contains the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. I can guarantee you that people who produce outstanding results think this way. Think about it in your own life. There are an infinite number of ways to react to any situation. Let's say your business fails to get a contract you had counted on, one that you were certain you deserved. Some of us would be hurt and frustrated. We might sit home and mope or go out and get drunk. Some of us would be mad. All of that might allow us to let off some steam, but it doesn't help us. It doesn't bring us any closer to our desired outcome. It takes a lot of discipline to be able to retrace your steps, learn painful lessons, mend fences, and take a good look at new possibilities. But that's the only way to get a positive outcome from what seems like a negative result. Take a moment to think again about your beliefs. Do you generally expect things to work out well or to work out poorly? Do you expect your best efforts to be successful, or do you expect them to be thwarted? Do you see the potential in a situation, or do you see the roadblocks? Many people tend to focus on the negative more than the positive. The first step toward changing that is to recognize it. Belief in limits creates limited people. The key is to let go of those limitations and operate from a higher set of resources. If you have a strong belief in possibility, it's likely you'll achieve it. Belief number two, there is no such thing as failure. Most people in our culture have been programmed to fear this thing called failure. I've used the words outcome and results throughout this book because that's what successful people see. They don't see failure. They don't believe in it. People always succeed in getting some sort of result. The super successes of our culture aren't people who do not fail, but simply people who know that if they try something and it doesn't give them what they want, they've had a learning experience. They use what they've learned and simply try something else. They take some new actions and produce some new results. Think about it. What is the one asset, the one benefit you have today over yesterday? The answer, of course, is experience. People who fear failure make internal representations of what might not work in advance. 
This is what keeps them from taking the very action that could ensure the accomplishment of their desires. Belief in failure is a way of poisoning the mind. When we store negative emotions, we affect our physiology, our thinking process, and our state. One of the greatest limitations for most people is their fear of failure. Dr. Robert Schuller, who teaches the concept of possibility thinking, asks a great question, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Think about it. How would you answer that? If you really believed you could not fail, you might take a whole new set of actions and produce powerful new desirable results. Wouldn't you be better off trying them? Isn't that the only way to grow? So I suggest you start realizing right now that there's no such thing as failure. There are only results. You always produce a result. If it's not the one you desire, you can just change your actions and you'll produce new results. Cross out the word failure, circle the word outcome in this book, and commit yourself to learning from every experience. Belief number three, whatever happens, take responsibility. Another attribute great leaders and achievers have in common is that they operate from the belief that they create their world. Achievers tend to believe that no matter what happens, whether it's good or bad, they created it. If they didn't cause it by their physical actions, maybe they did by the level and tenor of their thoughts. If you don't believe that you're creating your world, whether it be your successes or your failures, then you're at the mercy of circumstances. Things just happen to you. You're an object, not a subject. Taking responsibility is in my opinion one of the best measures of a person's power and maturity. If you don't believe in failure, if you know you'll achieve your outcome, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by taking responsibility. If you're in control, you'll succeed. Belief number four, it's not necessary to understand everything to be able to use everything. Many successful people live by another useful belief. They don't believe they have to know everything about something in order to use it. They know how to use what's essential without feeling a need to get bogged down in every detail of it. If you study people who are in power, you'll find they have a working knowledge about a lot of things but often have little mastery of each and every detail of their enterprise. They exact the essence from a situation, take out what they need, and don't dwell on the rest. Successful people are especially good at making distinctions between what is necessary for them to understand and what is not. In order to effectively use the information in this book, in order to effectively use all that you are in this life, you should discover that there's a balance between use and knowledge. You can spend all your time studying the roots, or you can learn to pick the fruit. Belief number five, people are your greatest resource. Individuals of excellence, that is, people who produce outstanding results, almost universally have a tremendous sense of respect and appreciation for people. They have a sense of team, a sense of common purpose and unity. If there's any insight at the heart of the new generation of business books it's that there's no long-lasting success without rapport among people, that the way to succeed is to form a successful team that's working together. When Thomas J. Peters and Robert H. Waterman Jr., authors of In Search of Excellence, distilled the factors that made companies great, one of the key things they found was a passionate attention to people. There was hardly a more pervasive theme in excellent companies than respect for the individual, they wrote. The companies that succeeded were the ones that treated people with respect and with dignity, the companies that viewed their employees as partners, not as tools. As you read this book, keep in mind an image of a helmsman readjusting a ship's path as it moves toward its destination. It's the same with life. We have to constantly remain alert, readjust our behavior, and recalibrate our actions to make sure we're going where we want to go. To say you treat people with respect and to do it are not the same thing. Those who succeed are the most effective in saying to others, how can we do this better? How can we fix this? How can we produce greater results? They know that one man alone, no matter how brilliant, will find it very difficult to match the collaborative talents of an effective team. Belief number six, work is play. Do you know any person who has achieved massive success by doing what he hates? I don't. One of the keys to success is making a successful marriage between what you do and what you love. Pablo Picasso once said, when I work, I relax, doing nothing or entertaining visitors makes me tired. We hear a lot about workaholics these days. 
and there are some people whose work has become something of an unhealthy obsession. They don't seem to get any pleasure out of their work, but they reach the point where they can't do anything else. Researchers are finding surprising things about some workaholics. There are some people who seem maniacally focused on work because they love it. It challenges them, it excites them, it makes their life richer. These people tend to look at work the way most of us look at play. They see it as a way to stretch themselves, to learn new things, to explore new avenues. Are some jobs more conducive to this than others? Of course they are. The key is to work your way toward those jobs. One of those upward spirals is at work here. If you can find creative ways to do your job, it will help you to move toward work that's even better. If you decide work is mere drudgery, just a way to bring home a paycheck, chances are it will never be anything more. Belief number seven, there's no abiding success without commitment. Individuals who succeed have a belief in the power of commitment. If there's a single belief that seems almost inseparable from success, it's that there's no great success without great commitment. If you look at successful people in any field, you'll find they're not necessarily the best and the brightest, the fastest and the strongest. You'll find they're the ones with the most commitment. We see this in any field, even those where natural ability would seem to have the strongest hold. Take sports. The difference in pure physical skills between athletes seldom tells you anything. It's the quality of commitment that separates good from great. Throughout this book, you should be aware of additional distinctions or insights that you can add. Remember, success leaves clues. Study those who succeed. Find out about the key beliefs they hold that enhance their ability to take effective action consistently and produce outstanding results. These seven beliefs have done wonders for others before you, and I believe they can do wonders for you if you can commit yourself to them consistently. I can almost hear some of you thinking, well, that's a big if. What if you have beliefs that don't support you? What if your beliefs are negative, not positive? How do we change beliefs? You've already taken the first step, awareness. You know what you want. The second step is action, learning to control your internal representations and beliefs, learning how to run your brain. So far we've begun to put together the pieces that I believe lead to excellence. We started with the idea that information is the commodity of kings, that master communicators are those who know what they want and who take effective actions, varying their behavior until they achieve their outcomes. In Chapter 2, we learned that the pathway to excellence is through modeling. If you can find people who have created massive success, you can model the specific actions they consistently take that produce results, their beliefs, mental syntax, and physiology, so you can produce similar results in a shorter learning time. In Chapter 3, we talked about the power of state. We've seen how powerful, resourceful, and effective behavior can affect the neurophysiological state. In Chapter 4, we learned about the nature of belief, how empowering beliefs unlock the door to excellence. In this chapter, we've explored the seven beliefs that are the cornerstone of excellence. Now I'm going to share with you powerful techniques that can help you to make use of what you've learned. It's time to learn. Chapter 6, Mastering Your Mind, How to Run Your Brain.